Welcome back to the DMZ. Uh, for the first time since the DMZ has been in operation, uh, our conservative uh, uh, representative of Southern DMZ is on vacation. Uh, but we have brought back uh, the old favorite from the previous incarnation of the show of the weekend blog, uh, fan favorite, Kristen Soltis. Great to have you back. Glad to be back. I'm so excited. Now, uh, you you abandon us to chase your dreams oh, with the Gingrich for President campaign. Okay, uh, Whoa, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I work for a, a, a firm <laughs> that is run by David Winston, a prominent Republican pollster, longtime advisor of Newt, um, and I was in the, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all, <laughs> sort of, you know, I couldn't really talk about the Republican primary, and that was what was going on. <laughs> I didn't abandon you, and I <laughs> did not go chase my dreams. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, I, I didn't mean to dis dismirch your <laughs> reputation there. Uh, <laughs> but you, you had you had a, conf you had a professional conflict, yeah. so uh, you, had, you had to step aside. Uh, so what have you been doing uh, since uh, that campaign uh, uh, ran its course? Um, so recently I have been involved with a... Uh, a Republican super PAC called Crossroads Generation. It's um, so, so you're officially part of the problem. I am officially part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, I. It was kind of neat. I got you know called up in the spring, say, hey, you know, a bunch of prominent Republican folks have read your master's thesis on young voters and why the Republican Party is not doing well among them, and we would like your help. Help us win them back. Um, so, and I should point out, you you were recently quoted prominently. And uh, this rag sheet called the New York Times about yeah. your your efforts to uh, bring young voters into the Republican fold. I Congrats actually, on that. I picked up, I, it's like still sitting here on my desk, my desk is mess. I picked up the physical copy of the paper, which is like, I haven't done that in a long time. I'm always <laughs> just reading it electronically. I was like, oh, I need this for my mom. Um, yeah, so it's it's been an exciting ride. Um, you know, I've. It, I'm not allowed to coordinate with any official campaigns, which mm -hmm. I think actually makes it easier for me now to, to come on the show. So you, you, so you guys don't meet at a Starbucks somewhere and just no. like have, oh, I'm just having a coffee here. By the way, my organization's messaging is blah, blah, blah. That doesn't happen? <laughs> no, I mean, it, I don't. I'm I'm not nearly enough like spy versus spy. But you know what was very spy versus spy? How the Romney campaign picked Ryan in secret. Ooh. So you, See, you, I'm, you, I'm, you, I'm like, you, I'm really out of practice with this, like, segue you, you, in topics. <laughs> do, you, do, you have, do you have insider uh, scoops for us? No, I just, I loved reading all of the, like, TikToks that the different oh. journalists wrote about how, like, Ryan, when, when he got, like, in order to get picked, he had to fly to Boston, but he didn't fly from Wisconsin to Massachusetts. Instead, he flew from Chicago to Hartford and drove just, with, like, he, he, used, he used my airport. That, that's my neighborhood's that's airport. That's very cool. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, he, and the Br Bradley Airport favorite. in Hartford is the best airport because nobody uses it, so there's never any lines. Nice. It's awesome. I have found uh, that whenever that Providence Airport is pretty great, too, mm. as far as that goes. <laughs> um, instead of flying into Boston, flying into Providence is pretty solid. Um, but uh, there certainly is a lot of uh, – if the Ryan pick was designed to change the conversation away – from uh, Mitt Romney's tax returns, I would say it, it has been a success on that front. Yes. Uh, we are certainly talking, we, it, it, we're now uh, five, six days into the pick. We're still talking about Ryan and his impact on the race and uh, what's in his budget, how does it match up with the Romney plan, are, are, they, are they joined at the hip or not. Uh, there's been various discussion, uh, it seems, within the right, within, within Republican circles, was this a wise thing to do? Uh, from your vantage point as a professional pollster who has uh, 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 apparently very credible theories on how to win over young voters, uh, was the Ryan pick uh, the way to go? Uh, so the... I, I... When I first heard about it, I was very excited but really nervous. It's kind of like when you find out that the really obscure band that you like just got signed to a huge record label, and you're like, uh-oh, I hope this means their music's not going to suck now. He's um, the eight repos of the Republican Party? <laughs> he's, he's, like, he's like our indie, you know. Or I, I, the, the way I explained it to my husband was that um, he really likes Joss Whedon, the guy who mm -hmm. directed oh, – he, he was like he did Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Firefly and Serenity. Um, like, big cult figure in, like, the Comic-Con 
world. Um, and when he got chosen to be the director for the Avengers, this was like, oh my gosh, Joss Whedon gets to direct like the biggest film in Hollywood. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. But it was also nerve-wracking for him because he thought, well, if the movie tanks or if it's not good or if broad America does not like the sass mouth awkwardness of Whedon's style, um, he may never get to direct a big movie again. And that's kind of how I looked at the Ryan pick, because I was like, ooh, I, you know, on, on the Weekend blog, I, I talked frequently about how I liked Paul Ryan and how I thought it was great that he was somebody who was putting forward ideas. Um, even if he didn't love them, at least he was putting some kind of plan and out there. So um, were, were you hopeful in advance that Ryan was going to get picked? No. Or were you... Mm -mm. So who who, who, oh. was your, who was your choice? Who did you? Oh, want? I thought I thought that it was going to be the do no harm. I I, I plenty Portman flip a coin. Is that what, what you thought. wanted? Is that what you wanted? No. Um, what did what did you want? Uh, well, I uh, what I wanted was I wanted the Romney campaign. I didn't want them to pick someone because they thought it would win over a certain slice of voters, like love Marco Rubio, but would have seen it as kind of a cynical pick to choose him, like, oh, well, we're going to win Hispanic voters in Florida now. Um, so I'm kind of glad they didn't go that direction. I, I wanted them to pick someone who was going to bring substance to the ticket and going to bring ideas to the ticket. Ryan brings a lot of substance <laughs> and ideas to the ticket, almost to the point where it's like, that you've seen Romney come out in the last few days and say, um, no, he joined my campaign. I didn't join his campaign. It's been this kind of like cute little dance of like, no, let's remember who's the number two here. Um, but Ryan was so chock full of substance, whether you liked his substance or not. And Romney had been sort of intentionally vague. Or I mean, he'd had his like 59 point plan for the economy, but, you know, I could, could anybody name more than three or four of those points um, beyond broad, broad bleh, just basic rhetorical brushstrokes. Um, and so uh, that, I think that was, in my view, the, the risk of the pick. The other thing that I've likened it to is that really there's this – did you watch the Olympics, Bill? Were you, like, I, into the Olympics? I, I have never been into the Olympics. I don't understand why anybody is. I don't, I don't get why people all of a sudden go crazy about sports that they do not follow otherwise. <laughs> Synchronized diving is so fascinating. It, it was, see, the thing is, if these sports, how could I follow synchronized diving otherwise? If NBC gave me a channel where I could watch it more frequently, I definitely I mean, do you, would. Where do, you, do, you, do you check out synchronized diving online? Do you find the synchronized diving websites over the, the previous four years in anticipation for this moment? No, no. If it was in primetime TV, though. <laughs> Maybe. No, well, so, okay, so gymnastics really got into that. Okay. And one of the things that was big this year was that the American team was going to do really well, or the, the women's American team was going to do well because there's this vault that they can do called the Aminar vault. It's this crazy, like, you flip onto the board, and then you fly up in the air, and you spin around two and a half times, and you do a blind landing while you're still twisting. Only, like, Wikipedia only lists, like, two dozen women who have ever attempted this in competition. It can, like, wreck your knees if you do it wrong. It's hugely dangerous. Um... But if you do it, you get an awful lot of points for it, if you do it well. Um, its start value is very high. And so I think like picking Paul Ryan is kind of like that vault of the presidential <laughs> I mean, it, campaign. See, what I don't get is, if I'm a conservative, and I love, and I love Paul Ryan's ideas, and I want to radically um, shrink the welfare state and all, 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 that, all that good stuff, uh, it, it seemed that the conservative movement had, for the last month, been laying the groundwork for a distancing between themselves and Ryan and Romney. Uh, so when Romney loses, which seems to be what most people still expect, they can say, well, don't blame us. Don't blame conservatism. Conservatism is still awesome. Said is, Romney sucks. Yeah, this was Matt's big thesis, right? Like, he, right. like this is the big, yeah, you know, oh, well, if Romney loses, is it really a loss for conservatism? And at that mm -hmm. time, I could see, you know, if Romney was standing well, Matt, for... Well, Matt was making a slightly different point there. Matt okay. was just saying that they, <laughs> they, they, the cycles of history go, go in all sorts of directions, and you can't predict when winning is losing and losing is winning. Right. Uh, it, it wasn't so much that Romney in of itself... Uh, I mean, I don't think he considers Romney a real standard bearer of conservatism, but I think he was making a slightly different point there. But I would think now uh, conservatives are now all in. <laughs> and if, if, Romney lo if Romney Ryan loses you know, by a decent margin... And and the Ryan plan is central to the debate. How do you get away from saying Obama has won a clear, unequivocal mandate, and conservatism has been clearly rejected by the public, and now you're in the the doghouse for for several years? So why do conservatives want to hitch hitch that dream to the Romney wagon of all places? Well, it strikes me as strange. And that's that. So that's that's the fear. So on the one hand. I mean, everybody was saying, you know, Obama got a clear mandate, conservatism is dead in 2008, and come 2010, 
it was all different. And now 2012, it's all different again. So I think the cycles of history may be speeding up a little bit. <laughs> um, but that, that I will admit that was a, an initial fear of mine, right? Like if you're going to do this, if, if you're going to talk about the next four years, that's an easier conversation to have. You could say, I think Obama's plans weren't working. Here's why I think my policies are going to create economic growth. That's, that's, that's an easier debate. And that's a debate I think Romney was reasonably well suited for. The reason that you don't have tons and tons and tons of Republicans out there arguing in favor of the Ryan plan, or at least you didn't until a week ago, is because it's really hard to do that. You have to basically be Paul Ryan in order to be equipped to give that defense. Because these are really tough issues, and it's, it's never uh, easy to argue in favor of, you know, scaling back spending and things. I mean, this, this is not an easy task. And well, I have, a, I, have was, a, I have a theory here. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, did you uh, well, do I was going to say, I, I just, the Romney campaign had been like a basic level of competence, but the, the <laughs> task they had taken on by now arguing in favor of not the next four years, but the next 40 years of policy, that's big. They'd better be prepared for the debate that they have just started. And so... We've got 82 days to find out if they are. <laughs> well, I, I have two thoughts in response to that. Well, let's make this one. Well, I'll make my first point. It seems to me that that conservatives haven't. So, correct me if I, my presumption is wrong. This is just my own my own speculative theory. The conservatives have internalized that uh, the debt crisis is existential. Uh, Obama's uh, driving us off the cliff. We're going to be Greece uh, unless not if he loses, but that we we do this radical overhaul. Ryan style, but it's so complicated. It's so hard to convince the the, the lemmings of America, the, the small minded masses of the tough choices we have to make. And only if we have someone as uniquely articulate as Paul Ryan uh, to, to, to educate the public and elevate the debate is the only way we'll ever do this. Uh, and it's that kind of thinking that is long has for a long time been been liberal thinking. <laughs> liberals are the ones always saying, if only we can educate the public and overcome the simplistic conservative sloganeering, can we possibly win? But usually, attempts at mass education in a two month campaign time frame almost always fail. So, yes. why are conservatives attempting to to emulate the the worst political strategy of liberalism? <laughs> Because they really believe in what they're saying, Bill. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I fear that's true. <laughs> no, I, I think that it's. Um, I, I think that the the argument from the conservative conservative side is that it's easier to promise people you'll give them things than it is to promise um, that you will take less things in the future. If that makes sense, um, that that it's easier to say, you know, we want to give you all of these wonderful things, and you know, people like to hear that. Um, the Ryan plans, I worry, like it's, it's so process focused. It's so focused on like, you know, oh, if we, if we let's do this to column A, let's do this to column B that like right now, the big debate that is happening over Medicare is like, well, how is Obama going to achieve 700 billion in less Medicare spending? I didn't call it cuts because this is DNC and I'm being nice. <laughs> um, 700 billion in less spending on Medicare. Um, and then you know, how would Ryan achieve that? And does he want to achieve that? And over what time frame? I think that when unemployment is at 8% or higher, uh, I think your vast majority of voters, they they care about that, but they just want to know how we're going to get create jobs. And so um, it's, it's not that voters are dumb and if only we could educate them, they would all agree with us. It's just these are complicated issues. Uh, and so, you know, on either side, um, to what extent does the you know the average voter understand you know understand an Ezra Klein post about these sorts of things either? I mean, it's not just I think conservative or liberal. I think the problem is that the conservative position, whenever you're talking about you know reforming entitlements, you are effectively saying you want to change the program uh, in a way that is going to cost less money, and then you're having to rely on here's why we think that choice and competition mean same outcome, less money. Uh, that's not only a few steps removed, like, okay, we have to do X, and then Y will happen, and then Z will happen, and then we will end up with this happy outcome. Um, but it's also very separate from what I think this campaign will ultimately be about, which is jobs in the economy. And so is that further complicating things because you're, you're off chasing this Medicare debate and who's getting $700 billion out of what and when and how, when is that the central issue? So uh, if I can... Read between the lines a little bit from what you're saying there, or at least to 
go off in a slightly different direction. Uh, do, do you have a bit of a concern that this pick is moving the Romney campaign off of jobs and on to Medicare, where jobs is issue number one in the eyes of most voters? That was my initial fear, and I my fear has been um, set aside. There, there was a whole Politico article, like, quoting a bunch of anonymous Republican consultants in varying stages of total panic over this, um, which I think is a little overblown. Uh, I think it was inevitable that the debate was going to shift to, like, hey, what makes Paul Ryan special? Well, what makes Paul Ryan special is he is the entitlement reform guy. So, yeah, of course that was what the debate was going to be about. But they've actually been pretty good, like, I mean, Ryan has had where are the jobs as, like, the core of what he's talked about at various stops on the campaign trail this week. So I think they get that. I, I, I trust that they, they get that this <laughs> is about the economy. And I actually think that it will be Democrats who are very excited now that this is on the table um, and want to make the debate about this instead of jobs in the economy because this is, this is always sort of, you know, re entitlement reform has always been like a trap for Republicans. <laughs> now, uh, again, we're trying to play by DMZ rules here. We're not going to have a big, giant debate whether, you know, who's telling the truth about uh, Medicare yep. and, and cut spending and whatnot. Uh, but just trying to analyze. So, so here, so the Robert McCammon makes this pick. I'm just trying to analyze political tactics here. So okay. you know, challenge me if you think I'm, I, I'm mistaken. Okay. Uh, they make the pick. They, they do it with eyes wide open. They know picking Ryan means taking on a lot of incoming in regards to Medicare. Uh, and they seem to be handling it by you know, turning into the skid. They're, they're, not, they're not avoiding the Medicare issue per se. But they're not putting Ryan out there with a big PowerPoint presentation for all the particulars of his plan or, or to say, well, here is, you know, well, the Romney plan is not the Ryan plan. Here's the Romney plan. And it's like this. They are mostly making a negative attack, trying to besmirch what the Affordable Care Act does to Medicare, uh, and then just sort of saying very generically, we're going to save Medicare, and not really getting into the details about what that, that means. Uh, so it, it, it seems to be a game plan to uh, make it a wash. Yes. Uh, uh, as, and this maybe undercuts what I was saying before about Orion having a big national seminar for two months. Uh, they, it, it seems to be we actually did, did not have that seminar to just drag, drive everyone down to the muck so no one gets an edge over and then maybe move to jobs after that. Uh, and if that's the game plan, I, I, think it, I think it's also a risky plan because I, I, I do think they have a fact-check problem. or At, at minimum, they're, ta they're, they are, they're having to deal with the fact that there are fact-checkers out there saying you're, you are not being accurate about, about Obama's plan. Anymore. But their general attitude about that sort of thing is, who cares about what fact-checkers have to say, you know, because uh, w people distrust uh, the media in general, so we can make our case and people can take it or leave it. Seems to be the attitude. Well, Republicans have been making that case, though. I mean, even in in the 2010 election, that was. I mean, if you turned on a TV in any district where there were seniors, I mean, that was what you know the NRCC. That was they were running on, met. You know, this is going to cut Medicare. Um, right. So you know, it's not. It's not as though all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Republicans decided, hey, we can fight back on Medicare. I mean, they've been, this argument was being made by various campaigns and various sectors of the, the conservative movement previously. I think the, the, what's new is, is this going to be embraced by the Romney campaign, or is it going to be embraced by, um, at the, the, the congressional race and Senate race level as a way of playing defense. Because that was a, the other big concern that popped up the day that Ryan was chosen, that you had the anonymous Republican consultants telling Politico, oh, no, now this is going to hurt us in congressional races across the country. I think well, that, I, I, that's why I, you're I, seeing, like, I think the Romney campaign might not push back on this. I think they're going to stay very jobs in the economy. And I think you'll see other groups take up the mantle of this issue. Well, I mean, down ballot, I mean, as you said, this happened in 2010. I don't think anyone in the Republican Party at any level has a problem saying Obama cut your Medicare and gave it to somebody else, you know, again, regardless of what the, the facts may be on that subject. Uh, the problem that seems the down ballot folks are concerned about is defending the voucher part of the Ryan plan, which, as far as I can tell, the Romney group is embracing that. I, I find the media sort of odd in this. There, there, there seems to be this, this, this questioning, you know, does, the, do, does Romney embrace Ryan's plan? The talking point is, no, we embrace the Romney plan. Uh, but when you ask, and, you know, John Snuna was asked this on MSNBC, um, 
you know, don't you want to have a voucher program for people under 55? You know, Suna says yes. Well, that's that's the controversial part of the Ryan plan as far as Medicare is concerned. Uh, so and, and so as much as that becomes front and center, um, this is where I think that the Romney tactic is strange to me. Uh, it's one thing to level the cut Medicare charge two years ago, fresh off of the bill being passed. But it's been three years now. And if you're a senior on Medicare, I mean, this is just a factual statement. Your benefits haven't been cut. Your, your, the reimbursement you get from when you go to the doctor is the same as it was. Uh, if anything, you, you got a rebate check off, off the, on your drugs for, from the partial closing of the donut hole. So I just wouldn't think that would be a resonating argument right now. Maybe you're going to argue whether they're going to they're screw you 20 years from now. Uh, but if you haven't seen an actual benefit cut in the last three years, why would you be angry about that now? Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that there's actually a cut happening around the corner because there isn't, but I'm just saying from a political standpoint, uh, I, I just wouldn't think seniors would be up in arms about that kind of charge, whereas the voucher charge still seems to have juice to it, uh, that there is a fear that you're going to undercut what Medicare has been. Again, it's kind of something that's been tried a lot, of, a lot of times in the past, and it still seems to uh, induce anxiety. So I, I would think that would be the tough part for the down ballot folks to want to deal well, with. Aren't Democrats, what Democrats seem to be doing is that, as you mentioned, the, the premium support program would go into place you know, 10 years from now. It wouldn't affect current seniors. It would affect people who are 55 and under. But the argument always gets twisted there to be like, oh, Paul Ryan wants to, he's coming for your Medicare. Um, when he said repeatedly, this is only affecting people under 55, and the idea is that you would still get all of the same benefits, but by injecting choice. Why, why is that such a good argument? Uh, I mean, I, I agree with you. That is, the, that is the plan. It is not for current senior. Although there, there, there are other cuts no, for current I'm seniors in the right plan, but not the voucher I'm thing. saying politically, that well, politi distinction, politi Democrats are not making that distinction. <laughs> They're just I find that... I find, politically speaking, that argument strikes me as very incoherent because I mean, either vouchers are awesome or they're not. Uh, if they're not awesome, uh, I mean, why do you have to tell someone, oh, yeah, we're doing vouchers but not for you? Well, that sort of suggests that maybe there's something wrong with vouchers. If they're so great, why would you give them to everybody right now? Well, you could probably. I, I, I expect that you could choose to opt. I, I don't know the exact uh, details of what his plan would do to change things within the next 10 years. But the idea is that if you are already preparing for retirement with one system, you get to stick with that system. And if you still have 10 years to prepare for another system where you'll be having more choice, I mean, that, that, makes, that makes intuitive sense to me, that you wouldn't change things immediately for people who are, are participating in the program, that you have to start a, a, a line somewhere. It seems to me to be completely reasonable. I mean, and I think. Well, well okay, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I, that, 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 that's a, if, you, if, if you're arguing from a, it's a it's a point of slow transition to a new system. I mean, you could uh, you could make that case. Uh, I feel like the way they say it when they're saying, you know, it's it's for them, not for you. Uh, I I don't think that's as smooth a way as what you just did. I I will grant you that there are lots of ways that communication could be done differently and, and that and again that's the big risk is the Romney campaign ready for what they just opened up are they can can they can they communicate and talk about this and do they have the substance of what the Romney plan would look like versus what the right you know I mean it seems to me if you read like when the decision was made and who all was involved in the decision I mean if you want to have the sort of like prep time to really roll out something like this, two weeks is not a lot of time. Um, mm -hmm. One week is not a lot of time. And so mm -hmm. I can't wait to read like the, you know, Mark Halperin book after the fact that like says mm -hmm. like, how much was Lan Hee Chen and like the policy shop in like meltdown mode? Like, oh my God, we have so much stuff we have to come up with and like figure this, out. This, this I mean, is where they don't get. I mean, it, I mean, Ryan proposed this two years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not a brand new idea. Uh, and he proposed it two years ago. He, he, he corralled the House into voting for it. it. It did not help in the first special congressional election that occurred in a Republican race soon after that. So the first test run of those messages did not succeed. Right. Um, but there's still this sense that somehow Ryan is this uniquely articulate figure uh, that can make this case to the public, and and the Ryan case has been. Well, you know, I I win my right. I win my races in Janesville, Wisconsin, 
in a in a union heavy left leaning district, and I win there, so I must be really awesome at making this case. But if you read the um, the New Yorker profile on him by Ryan Liz that just came out, he he won this won his first race there because his family name is Gold because he helped build the town in the nineteenth and early twentieth century. He didn't oh, win it, but because <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't have a sense that there is any there's there's no case study of Ryan going to unfamiliar turf mm -hmm. and using the messages that he has used and winning over converts. Where And, and it's not like the messages that failed in 2011 on this score in, in Upper New York have been changed in any way. They're the same messages. So, I mean, so again, I, I, that's why I see the Romney folks, they really aren't necessarily going whole hog on those messages. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to kick up a lot of dust with with the Obamacare charges and maybe not going all that deep into making the case for vouchers. Yeah. Oh, I, I think that I think they don't want to make this an election about the Ryan plan. And I think by choosing Paul Ryan, you you've made that very difficult. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, I mean look I they they've chosen someone who I, I, I hope that Paul Ryan doesn't become just the entitlement reform guy, because he's he's a bright guy on a lot of other topics. He's not just, you know, let's put on the green eye shade and like cut things here and there. I mean, he's, and I, so I think if they can pivot him to talking about jobs, to talking about things that are not the Ryan plan, I think he'll be a very effective surrogate, um, a very effective, you know, spokesperson for, um, you know. Romney's vision for America. Uh, so, but, but we'll see. I mean, this well, we, this a month from now, we can still be talking about Medicare. I hope we're not. Well, well, well. One more Ryan question for you before we shift and talk about uh, his, his 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 counterpart Joe Biden. <laughs> uh, it also seems that Ryan was picked not just to change the subject away from tax returns, not just to put a different issue set on the table, uh, but also to appeal to to younger voters. Uh, and I presume, and actually I didn't catch this myself, but, uh, but my wife, in looking at the announcement, was saying, you know, why, why, why is, is, he, is, he, is he not wearing a tie? <laughs> and I said, yeah, he's not wearing a tie. He's, he's wearing, wearing a, tie. a That's huge jacket. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, not very well, he, he didn't go to Brooks Brothers and get it fitted properly, it seems, but that's, that's a bit of a snarky way. We, we can be superficial about male candidates. That's what from another oh, yeah. candidates. Paul Ryan we, we, has we... opened the door for superficial. <laughs> I mean, I just yesterday, you know, there there has been actual like objectification of him in a way that would just <laughs> never fly with a Repu like a, a, a female candidate. Right. Oh my that, gosh! Look, I I do not wear properly fitted clothes a lot of the time. I feel like if I was running for president, I would be as socially awkward as Mitt Romney, and be as poor a dresser as Paul Ryan. So I'm not being judgmental here, uh, but it did seem like that that that's, that collar was a little big on that guy's neck. Am I, I'm not wrong about that. No, no, you're not wrong. But you know what? We're we're not electing America's next top model. <laughs> so. But my wife pointed out, well, they, they must be trying to appeal to young voters by him not wearing a tie. And then you know, their next comment was, "That's ridiculous. <laughs> How's that going to work?" But it seemed to be what the the logic must have been. Mitt Romney you wore, has, when was the last time Mitt Romney wore a tie on the campaign trail? I think that, and I don't think it's just a young voter thing. I think it's an uh, I get I get you average guy kind of thing. I don't think it's like an age but, thing so but, much. But, as why, but why would Romney have a tie and Ryan not have a tie the same day? on the announcement day there, there has to have been some kind of political logic what kind of what kind of image and message you're trying to communicate on that day yeah I, I mean I imagine that it's that they they probably calculated that Paul Ryan's brand could go wonky dork or it could go <laughs> um, you know fresh faced new face of the party uh, and that a tie would indicate one of those more than the other. So, yeah, I'm sure there was, I, you know, there might have been a focus. But, but, do, you, but do, you, do you think it's an explicit play for young voters or just a more generic No, I don't think it's an explicit thing. play for young voters. I uh, have not seen the Romney campaign take a significant interest in really, really seriously reaching out to young people. I think a lot of that, um, I think their, their message has just been so broad for so long that it's a message that can work with young people, but I, they don't, like, I don't see Mitt Romney traveling around to, like, a million different college campuses. So I don't, like, the idea that they would take their VP pick, like, the single biggest decision that they're going to make and make that about young voters, I think, eh, probably not. I'd love to think that they had that in mind, but <laughs> probably not. Um, I think it was um, more that 
Romney thought, this guy's a smart guy. He reminds me of the type of people that I've hired in the past. Let's bring him on board. Um, okay, so uh, the other VP news this week is Joe Biden. Uh, and as, as everybody knows at this point, he was talking about how Wall Street has been unchained, and he said they're going to put you all in chains, speaking to um, a, a, a racially diverse audience. Folks on the right were saying he was, he was making a racially divisive comment, uh, suggesting that the Romney-Ryan ticket would, would literally put blacks back into, into slave chains. Uh, Obama has stuck up for Biden, saying that's not what he was saying. He was just talking about, about Wall Street. Um, and let's not have manufactured outrage about this. Um, and this has kicked up a fresh round of talk. Uh, I saw Sarah Palin do this. I, I saw Chris Matthews do this. That would, would Obama actually dump Biden now? You know, one, one gaffe too many. You know, the, the whole the Hillary fantasy comes back. Um, uh, I, I've always, right. I mean, I, my attitude from this is always, I, I've always thought this was ridiculous from the get-go. Uh, uh, you, you almost never see VP switches lay in the game because they, they always reek of panic. I mean, if, if you really want to get rid of somebody, it's to do it, would, would, would send the signal, wow, we're really losing badly here. I have to make this radical change. Uh, and... And through no point of this campaign has Obama really been losing. So why would there even be a need for such a panic move has always been elusive to me. Uh, and Biden seems to me to still have his strengths in campaigning in, uh, you know, white working class areas that are not Obama's strong suit. So he, that helps him spread the map a little bit more. And I don't think any of these so-called gaffes change that. Uh, but from from your vantage point, do you think Biden is he's a drag at this point? Would it would it be helpful if, if if he was switched, or is this all just a lot of you know standard cable catnip noise? Uh, I think it's standard cable catnip noise. But I am really excited about the vice presidential debate um, because I think that's if there was going to be anywhere where Biden could be a liability um, or prove himself a surprising asset, uh, it could be the vice presidential debate. Um, which I would love to see multiple <laughs> vice presidential <laughs> debates at this point. Um, I'm already excited for it. Uh, but again, high risk, high reward well, situation. Well, I, but I think I, uh, I, Biden is a gaffe machine, but my belief is that I don't think that the Obama campaign cares that much about, like, oh, Joe said something silly today. Cable News will talk about I mean, it for I mean, a day. And it will right, I mean, the, the, the gaffes that he has done, to except they are gaffes, I mean, none of them have been like truly scandalous. None of them have. Re I mean, they might seem come as a little goofy or silly. Um, uh, some of the so so there, yeah. The, well, there are like two types of Biden gaff. Like there's the what was it yesterday? He said we were in the 20th century. Like there's stuff like that that's just right. stupid and but, doesn't matter. But, and both sides, you know, everyone misspeaks like that, and it's never been taken all that seriously. Generally right. Speaking. What I think made the whole chains thing a bigger deal is that there's a sense, and Republicans are have jumped on this, is I, some, who wrote yesterday? Um, there was a, a journalist, nonpartisan, uh, this, if you Google, maybe it's Ron Brownstein, he said that this campaign suddenly feels like the guardrails are gone, that like, it's now no longer, hey, I disagree with your ideas. Hey, you disagree with my ideas. And it was, well, then again, it was never that. But that it's, um, that now, like, we are alleging that Mitt Romney gave someone cancer. Or we are alleging that Barack Obama, like, I mean, that, 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 that on both sides, that it's like, that there's just no, there's nothing too low that you would accuse your opponent of for, like, no reason. And that it therefore wouldn't be actually that surprising that the Vice President of the United States would accuse his political opponents of wanting to put African Americans in chains. That like that is how, that's where we've gotten. And so that's, that's why I think that gaffe was, was actually damaging or could have been damaging in a way that like saying the wrong century or saying that you're in Virginia when you're in North Carolina is, is not. Well, um, I mean, it's it, obviously the Romney campaign seems to have an interest in in accusing the Obama campaign of of having a campaign of hate, a campaign of division, uh, and diversion. Uh, at, at minimum, it seems to be a way to sort of uh, uh, take Obama's image down a couple notches and not make him. Uh, 
uh, as favorable a candidate in the eyes of most voters. Uh, so many of you disagree with this. Po most people would say, I like Obama. I think he's a good guy. I, I would disagree with his policies, but I still like him. That, that's the way I should take the shine off of that. Uh, there's a more, there's even more harsher take that I've heard that perhaps Romney is trying to play his own version of a race card here, combined with the welfare charges that he's made. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think that why, why, why I don't think it's going to work very well is it's not like that Biden comment is is symbolic of a pattern of rhetoric. I mean, I don't think the Obama committee is generally speaking going around saying that Romney and Wright are going to enslave black people. Well, but, it, uh, it, but there has been an escalation of like, I mean, you, you can start with war on women. Like it's that the, the, the rhetoric isn't just that like Republican policies are bad, but that they're like actively trying to destroy the lives of people who are women and minorities and poor and that like that that's that that's where this has gone that it's like not that republicans wake up and they favor policies that might be bad for a certain group but that they like wake up and they're like yes how can i make things worse for women in america today and that's the narrative that's being pushed and so when biden comes out and says something like put in i mean that just like it fits right in with with what republicans have been saying like that now what has surprised me is that i have always been sympathetic to the idea that like Republicans are tough and the Democrats are sometimes wimps on the campaign trail. And so I, I've been sympathetic to this. I've heard my liberal friends say, like, they're frustrated. They wish Democrats would be tougher. So I think it's surprising to see Democrats now, like, in, in my view, not all Democrats, but some of them starting to sound like the elements that I've, like, there are elements on the right that I've often been like, eh, I, I don't like the, where they're going. And now it sounds like that kind of thing is becoming more prominent on the left and more mainstreamed on the left. And I think that's why Republicans are now playing the like, why are Democrats being so mean card? Well, this is another, this is another example where I feel like the right is taking uh, the bad ideas from the left, strategically speaking. <laughs> when we complained in the Bush years that the Republicans were too mean and questioning our patri patriotism, that's so unfair and it's so low and McCarthyite, and you know, we all want to get Bin Laden and we all, bipartisanship past the water's edge, blah, blah, blah. It sounds like whining when you do that. <laughs> when someone is charging that you don't have America's best interest at heart and you say, wan, no fair. That's not explaining how you have America's best interest at heart. Right. I'm not saying it was a fair charge. I'm saying the, the whining was not the way to handle that. And I feel like the Romney campaign is doing a lot of whining. Uh, and and for and, you know, Bill Clinton said during the Bush years, he would say, "Look, folks, strong and wrong, strong and wrong beats weak and right." Uh, and you know, I think the hope for the Democratic side is you can, you can be strong and right at the same time. And while Obama, I think Obama's got the wimp charge a lot from the left uh, in, in terms of his legislative strategy, which I which I've long said was unfair, but that's certainly been a, 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 a staple critique. Uh, I do think this show is, look, I, I don't think what the Obama campaign does is out of bounds. I don't think they stray from the facts. Uh, but, and I said this to Matt, but they, sure, they throw elbows. They're not, they're not a namby-pamby campaign. Uh, and... Uh, and this is, and this is, I think, a somewhat new development. I mean, like the Clinton folks think we're pretty tough too, uh, but I don't think the Republican, the modern Republican uh, campaign apparatus, having had having the edge on this during the Bush years, isn't quite prepared to deal with how do you handle someone who is seen as favorable and as uplifting as Obama, who also knows how to throw elbows too. Uh, that if you can pull it off, it's a pretty powerful combo. If you can disarm it and say he's not he's not so uh, squeaky clean because of the elbow throwing, I, I, I can see why on paper it would make sense to try to elevate that concept. But I think it runs the risk of coming across like whining instead of actually responding to the charge and showing why it's false. Is there any discussion on the left? Like I remember when all the Bain stuff came out and Cory Booker kind of got, you know, he came out and said, like, oh, I don't think we should go there. And then he got kind of mm -hmm. slammed for, like, right. um, and is there any discussion on on the left, like, from, you know, oh, my, are we becoming too much like the things we used to say we hated about Republicans? I mean, is that is that a conversation at all, or is that? that I don't think that's a conversation right now. I do, there, there's a money conversation. Uh, I, I do think there is some conversation on the left that you know there is an Obama super PAC and he does have to, he does have the fundraise uh, does, does big dollar fundraisers and the system's rotten and that's where they get rid of Citizens United and all that stuff. I mean, it's not such a conversation that people are literally not going to vote for the guy. Uh, but I don't. But I, I think 
it would be one thing if uh, Obama's hits were were really beyond the pale, and obviously people can disagree on this point, but I think the war on women's stuff, there's no one on the left that's upset about that. They feel like you know the right does want to uh, uh, stop easy access to contraception. They do want to curtail access to abortion. Uh, they do want to make it hard for women to get health services. So that's, that, 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 that's a deep-seated fear. And they're quite pleased that Obama's taking that on uh, quite so firmly. Uh, as far as you know, uh, you're reaching out to Latinos, uh, they're, there's plenty of evidence that the right is not so keen on it, making it uh, easy for people who want to uh, immigrate to, to find work here. Uh, so there's 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 no consternation that they're 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 being tough on that. Uh, and it's certainly, as far as the Bain stuff goes, the tax return stuff goes, uh, you know, even you see a little bit of whining in in pundit quarters that Reed was being unfair. I mean, I mean, you, John Stewart is sort of an example of this. John Stewart ripped Harry Reid apart for making a base charge but I think most part most folks left say look if Romney want it's, it's one thing to say stop beating your wife so something you can't disprove but Romney can disprove this if he so chooses by releasing his return so suck it up and do it uh, so I think for most part people say hey good, good hardball by Harry Reid uh, uh, and so I, I do think there is a line that folks left would be uncomfortable crossing uh, I don't think they feel Obama's crossed it yet okay well, and I, I hope that uh, the spirit of the DMZ will flood out into this <laughs> campaign and that both sides will get back to the real issues at hand instead of, what? I mean, like, you know, like Obama making a Seamus joke. I guess I guess the, the, you guys probably think, like, eh, it's not, whatever, get over it. Whereas the right thinks, like, you're the president of the United States. You seriously just did that on the trail twice. Like, I think that's... Uh, I, I think that I I think I think people on the left love Seamus Jones. Yeah, <laughs> I figured you guys probably did. Um, yeah, so I I think the other thing is to what extent is your your median swing voter really tuned in right now and thinking like, gosh, I would have voted for Obama, but he made that Seamus joke, and I think that's unbefitting the office of the president. So no, you know, like I don't think I think well, so it, much of what's being chattered about now is like filling so, the void. I, I think it's a very interesting joke. <laughs> Uh, it's not. It's not just a cheap shot. Um, it's about wind policy. It's about the wind power tax credit. So he's in Iowa. He's in, he's he's in a wind heavy state where there are a lot of wind jobs. And there's a wedge issue here that Obama's for the wind power tax credit and Romney isn't and Ryan isn't. Uh, and Obama making this joke gets that issue on the news, particularly probably in local news. And elevates that issue locally. Uh, and this is where I feel that the Obama team, this is where it, it, you can say it's mean and nasty and, and, and cheap politics and whatnot, but it's also very, very creative. Yes. Uh, and, and it's a way that, and, and it's creative in a way that advances policy issues. It's, so it's not just being mean, it's also illuminating a policy difference. And this is a thing that I think the Romney campaign is not very good at. They're not creative at owning news cycles on their term. They've gotten, obviously, some news cycles on semi on their terms after the Romney pick, but, you know, VP pick is sort of, a, you know, the one big bullet in your chamber everybody gets to fire once. Uh, he has been very good at owning news cycles for the last three months. And if you hear wind power, something, you know, Obama's talked about wind power lots of times before. It's not like it's a brand new issue, but he found a new way to talk about it, a new way to, a new way to throw an elbow uh, that gets headlines, uh, and that's something I think the Romney team is just not very creative at. I wonder if the whole, uh, you know, pre-Ryan pick Romney campaign strategy of, you know, let's just focus on the economy, let's stay really broad, let's stay, you know, not not vague, but like, re you know, reasonably out of the weeds, that that kind of gets boring to the reporters who have to listen to it over and over and over and over and over again on the trail. And so, you know, something like this, uh, though it gets those reporters, they're all suddenly like, they're tweeting all about it. Um, you know, and that if you are changing your issue from, okay, now we want to talk about contraception, and now we want to talk about immigration, and now we're going to talk about the president changing on gay marriage, and now we're going to talk about the tax returns, and now we're going to talk about, you know, and it's, it's like every week, the Obama campaign has had like some new thing they're talking about, that that's a strategy that's better suited to a news cycle where journalists always need new stuff, like you need to feed the machine. So that's something that I think after this campaign, I'll be interested in like hearing people's take on like, is it, 
in the 24-hour news cycle, is there an incentive to like constantly change things up and constantly get creative and change your message versus trying to stick with the same narrative? And yes, those people who heard you talk about it in Iowa are different than the people who are hearing you talk about it the next week in North Carolina. But the same journalists are on the road with you, and the same journalists are covering those same stories. And so do they get bored and more likely to listen to the other side? Well, I mean, I, I think that's it, one, it's exactly right. The re reporters do get bored. They're on the trail. They have to write. They have to have fresh things to give or else they're just not going to write a story. The story is going to be on page 10. Uh, and and you can com you can complain about that. You can say it's unfair. You can say it's not good for illuminating issues. It's not good for having deep policy debates. But it's it it's not it a is. new. Yeah. It is, and, it, and it's always been that way. I mean, there's some there's some wrinkles to it in a 24/7 internet driven news cycle. But it's not like we have these grandly rich policy debates, you know, before this. Right. Um, there, you've always had to feed the, you always had to feed the media beast, and winning campaigns figure out a way to do that well it, in a way that's not so scattershot that it's not just, you know, chasing random headlines, but it communicates an overarching message. And there are some folks, I saw some media folks complaining in July that, oh, the Obama command, they're wildly careening from student loans to taxes and to the Buffett rule. And, uh, and, but there was all, everything the Obama campaign's done past few months is all about emphasizing these middle class type issues saying that we we are in sync with what the middle class needs and wants and the romney campaign is out of touch it's all been in that framework uh and it's all finding creative ways to emphasize an underlying consistent message uh so you gotta so you, you gotta do two sort of things in tension to pull that off uh but the campaign that does it is going to win the campaign that complains that the media dynamic is unfair is going to lose <laughs> Uh, and we'll see if the Romney campaign has found uh, a, a new uh, a new groove with this post Ryan, because um, there they are at least you know they are interjecting certain things into the debate now and getting headlines for it. I, I think there are things that carry downsides, but it's certainly more aggressive than where they had been. Uh, and so we'll see if that's enough to actually change the dynamic of the race around it. We'll, we'll, I think we'll see after the two conventions. Where the where the polls settle, and if there, there there is a change away from the Obama lead that he that he's had going into them. Now, are you going to the Democratic convention? I am going to the Democratic Ooh. convention. Fun, fun, fun. Uh, uh, so uh, hopefully, I can uh, be able to do some on the ground. I, I, I this actually I've been to the last two. I've never been to a Republican convention. Sad to say, um, but You're they are. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be actually more fun for me, quite frankly. Probably, uh, probably. Uh, but yeah, you know, because again, you're, you're at a, you're at your own team's convention, and it's, it's it's it can be hard to discern what what do I have new to say here? Mm -hmm. I'm just hearing the same messages I've always heard repeated over and over again. Uh, and so the Obama campaign has sort of figured out that it's a problem, and so they've they've shrunk the convention down to three days from four. Uh, and there's some indications that they're trying to do some novel things to make it interesting and make it more of a show. Uh, and we'll see how well. Uh, that works. But I, I always find it tough to blog at, at a big events like this because you're running around from event to event. You know, it's hard to find time to just sit down and write things and have thoughts. Uh, but I, I will do my best to uh, illuminate uh, what's going on in, uh, in Charlotte. But I, I, will you be in Tampa? Back to the, back to your home, your stopping grounds. I will. I will be in Tampa. Um, going there. Uh, there's a, a panel about young voters that I'm speaking on, so it was a fabulous excuse to just go down and <laughs> be part of the festivities. So um, yeah, I, I went to Minneapolis. I went largely. I just sort of like got a cheap plane ticket and showed up. And at the time, I was starting to launch a podcast, um, and so you know got basic blogger press credentials to whatever events would allow me to come watch and observe and interview people. I have footage of some members of Congress, like I'm interviewing them about like, what do you think about the vice presidential pick? And they're mispronouncing Palin's name because she's so fresh. They don't, they're like, they're like Governor Palin will be wonderful. <laughs> so I have all sorts of stuff like that I got um, from four years ago. I feel like uh, I will be approaching the convention a little differently this time for sure. Um, <laughs> But it was it was definitely uh, it was definitely fun four years ago. Do you, do you know if your panel is going to be streamed? Um, I don't know. Um, it's it is the Harvard Institute of Politics panel. Um, it's going to feature like Rock the Vote. Um, there's a, a documentary. Uh, a guy who does a show for MTV called Jenks. Uh, I am too old now. I don't know what's on MTV anymore. <laughs> but um, so it's it's but it's all talking about you know. How much is the youth vote going to be important? Because a lot of folks say, well, they're all going to stay home. They're all disappointed. They're all, 
you know, maybe they're not going to show up. And I, I think that is not the case. I think young voter will, will still be a huge and decisive part of this election. Um, I'm looking forward to convincing my Republican colleagues of the same. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, so where can folks find your 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 thoughts nowadays? Um, so nowadays it's mostly Twitter, uh, at KL Soltis. Um, you can watch my 140-character blobs of information. Uh, KristenSoltis.com, I update it really infrequently, um, but it's still there. Um, the other place where you can find stuff is uh, the, the group I'm working for now, Crossroads Generation. Very exciting. Thanks for being back on the DMZ. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Hopefully we do it again sometime soon. We have to get more vacation time. Yes, I like that plan. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Have a good one.